this is the best time, at least 15 years, and honestly, probably longer than that, to be starting a career in technology. focus on a culture that is good at repeating innovation. And I think this is one of the harder things to build in any kind of institution.
So, hello everyone. I'm Katrin Kösler, and on behalf of the TUM Speaker Series, I would like to welcome you all today to our event. The TUM Speaker Series provides a platform for sharing perspectives and listening to opinions of the leaders of our society. Therefore, I would like to remind you to be respectful during the whole event, but especially when asking your questions later in our Q&A. We are really excited to have Luisa Neubauer for our start of the semester here with us today and to see the Audimax so full. Um, you probably know Luisa as a climate activist from Fridays for Future, but she's also an author and a student like most of us. She will give a keynote on the topic ending the fossil era, followed by a moderated discussion about her life as an activist and climate action. Afterwards, we will also have time to answer your questions from the audience. But first, I would like to welcome Professor Werner Lang onto the stage. He's the Vice President for Sustainable Transformation at TUM and will give some opening words. Well, thank you very much for the kind words. I'm really extremely happy to see all of you here. And um, I'm amazed by what you as students can do by inviting, I think, one of the most important people, persons, activists uh, in the field of not only Friday for Future, but really making us rethink our world. That it's not that easy um, right now in a situation where we find a lot of people losing interest, forgetting that what we are dealing with here is the base of our existence. I don't know whether you follow basically that what the Stockholm Resilience Institute is telling us about the planetary boundaries, there are nine decisive planetary boundaries, and very recently they have published their latest report, so the core team of that report is 22 people worldwide renowned as scientists telling us that we have crossed already six boundaries. So to wait longer, to give us more time to see and evaluate, we don't have the time. And so to have somebody like Luisa who is reminding us, I'm not your generation, that's clear, but she's your generation reminding you, and we are in this together. Uh, it's very, very important. So I don't want to get into your life, Luisa. You might be discussing that a little bit. Uh, Friday for Future is something we don't have to explain. I think it's one of the most important movements we had in the past and still today we're having them. Became less loud, uh, but it's important to keep going and increase the activities there. Um, but the most important thing here is basically that you as students have also organized that, so I'm really happy and very thankful for you organizing this event, for you coming to this event, and I will stop here now, really, uh, to welcome our speaker, Luisa. The floor is yours. I'm extremely happy that you're here, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for having me. It's a little strange to speak in English, but we're going to go through it. Um, and uh, I think time is short, as I've understood it, so we'll dig right in. And um, we will answer, now the question is gone, but we will try to answer the question whether climate action is too late, but I think the first very important question to ask today and to maybe try to answer today is not whether climate action is too late, but why is it that climate action seems to have failed? And I think it's a, um, it's a, it's a moment where we have to kind of recognize um, that um, from 1988, when James Hansen, the NASA scientist, was sitting down at the Senate of the US speaking about climate science, until today, 
emissions have risen everywhere, destruction has increased around the world, ecosystems are dying, um, and we see it, um, as mentioned, our planetary boundaries are not just reached, but they're broken everywhere. So how is it that despite the best available science telling us for decades now how dire the situation is, just as well what solutions we have at hand, how is it that we are still failing? And I would like to talk about three misconceptions about climate action and uh, how we get out of this mess um, before coming to um, the more hopeful part. Um, and I think number one is, um, and I think that is something that should inform us today even still, um, the first very notion, the first big conception that we are seeing around the world when it comes to tackling the existential cri climate crisis, our first big misconception is that we believe that the science is our strongest argument. So whenever you would come into a room, just as I'm doing it now, I will come here and I will speak to you, informing you about the science, believing that the science, you know, will be strong enough, will be the, the best case that we have. The science tells us to do X, Y, Z, so we should do X, Y, Z. Yet when we just for a moment explore the history of climate science, we find that in the very first second of climate science being globally recognized, that very climate science was under attack. The very second that the first climate reports were published, the first newspapers would kind of go out and um, put all of that on the front title pages, that very moment was a time when the fossil fuel lobbies, the fossil fuel industries, some um, governments, some political parties started questioning that very science. We need the best available science today informing our action, driving what we do. But it's a huge mistake in my understanding to rely on that science to speak for itself because it has never spoken for itself before. Climate science never existed without climate denial. Climate science never existed without so-called counter-science debating those very facts. To, it used to be or used to think that a fact stands, you know, a fact has a authority out there. Yet today we find that my fact is worth just as much as your opinion. And in that discourse environment and that setting, facts alone won't bring us where we need to be. And so um, coming from the misconceptions that facts are all we need. We need to understand that facts drive what we do, but they cannot be the way how we do it. It is our job, it is the job to translate the best available science in languages that can be understood, that can be heard, that can be felt, that can be seen. So um, Bruno Latour is um, someone who has spoken about this before a lot. Um, and he speaks of the um, prescriptive potential of facts, meaning every fact out there, whoever you present those facts to, almost already seems like a to-do list. It seems more like a prescription of what to do than just a fact out there. I present you with the best available science, but people out there will translate it immediately to a to-do list and they will not sign up for that. So they turn away and pretend those facts don't exist. Number one, we need the science, but we cannot rely on the science to solve our problems. Second misconception, and I think Germany is a wonderful example to explore that further. Second big misconception, once we've agreed it's not about the better fact and it's not a, just about the science, people will assume, well, we need to have the better argument. We need to have the reasons. We need to have the good points. We need to have all we need to kind of win the climate debate with the good arguments. The good arguments being climate action means growing economy, climate action means more green jobs, climate action maybe means less catastrophe, kind of nice um, as, a, as a side. Um, climate action means having a right to the future, climate action means maybe respecting indigenous people. You know, that, that you know, the list is long. And yet when we see and we look closely 
to how exactly we have failed to implement all the knowledge we had in the past, we find very quickly that apparently it's not even about the better argument. Um, and I think when we when we're trying to illustrate this, let's have a look at the German Energiewende in the 90s and the um, in the years coming up. And then, yeah, but I think we can kind of set 92 as a starting date. We would have the big environmental summit in Rio, Angela Merck kind of coming out, telling people to recycle, as you do. And at the very same time, my grandmother would install her first solar panels on her roof. And it was a time that even in the US, um, America, you know, the presidents would come out and say, yes, we have the greenhouse effect, but we also have the White House effect. And it seemed also clear. There was an understanding that we have the science, it's very bad, but we also have all the good reasons to kind of drastically start to kind of invest in our actions because the economy could go green, the energy could go green and independent from autocrats, um, all these practical things. Yet even the best arguments we would have to in Germany follow along the path of a green energy revolution failed. It didn't fail because solar energy wasn't popular, people really liked it. It didn't fail um, back then in the beginning of the 2000s. It didn't fail because the prices didn't work out. They found very clever mechanisms to kind of lower the prices for solar energy. It didn't fail because um, there wasn't particular demand. It failed because relying on having the good facts and all of the good reasons alone wasn't enough to counteract fossil fuel interests. The moment that you rely on just having the better argument, you will fail. That's a lesson learned of the German Energiewende, where you had everything you needed from the business case to the case of the better morale, and still didn't succeed. Because when we speak of climate action, we do not speak of having the better fact and the better science, nor having the better reason or the better argument. No, we speak about questions of power, of emotions, of feelings, of belonging. And in Germany, what we see in the fossil fuel industry, just as well as in the automobile industry, we see an accumulation of power that is willing to fight facts, and that is willing even to fight the best available solution that we have at hand, namely a renewable energy transition. That is what happened in Germany. And you can even name that very power that is centered around fossil fuel interests, that is centered around fossil fuel profits, but that is also centered around the feeling of belonging to a fossil fuel society. It is um, centered around that emotion that automobile advertisements even, you know, um, grow in us. The, the fossil fuel interest is not just an interest about some certain profits or about a specific company evolving, but it's a whole history of who we are in the world. What is freedom? Is there freedom without cars going 180 kilometers per hour? I don't think so. Is there real Wohlstand? Is there real well-being without consuming everything all the time, wherever you are? Apparently not. Is there, real, um, is there a real career that isn't centered around status and emissions? Apparently not. Fossil fuel power, or you could call it facility. So the idea of um, um, let us not longer talking about emissions and, 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 and facts, but talking about feelings and emotions, um, that is something that is even within us. Or to maybe translate it a bit, when I talk about facility, you can, talk, you can consider the patriarchy as a, um, as a frame. What is patriarchy? It is not just men having more powerful position than men, women and earning more on average, but it's a whole idea of some superior energy that is centered around everyone that is male, or that is considered male. Um, and we see, and wherever you would come into a room, there would be some slight tendency to listen to men longer. You would come into a room and there would always be the slight tendency to be a bit more concentrated and more focused when a man would be speaking instead of a woman. And that is what you can very well translate to fossil fuel energies. 
whenever you would have solutions, even in today's politics, you would have a fossil fuel solution and you would have a renewable solution. We would see that there is a tendency to trust those fossil fuel solutions a bit more, just because they seem a bit more reliable, because they seem like something we've seen before, it's something you can count on, you, you know, it's something that's like a safe space to go. So when we speak about moving away from fossil fuels, we do not talk about statistics and good mechanical questions about technologies, and we don't only speak of business case A or business case B, we don't only speak about investments and all these interesting things to come along with it, but we challenge our understanding of what is a good life, what is a safe society, what is a solid economy, what is a good job, what is a good career. That is what comes along. So when we want to challenge fossil fuel interests and fossil fuel systems, coming along and presenting some kind of CO2 calculations is a, is a nice, nice try, but is a doom to fail. Because they don't calculate, they feel, they accumulate, they juggle with powers. And when we look at the automobile industry, we see how they do it. How has Germany become one of the nations with, uh, where, where there are more cars on the streets than what seems like everything else. Not because the automobile industries came to, went to from house to house presenting some nice facts of how you could just be a little bit faster when you go to work. No. They flooded every advertisement, every movie, every blockbuster, every superhero film that comes along with really nice cars. They presented to us um, spots of very beautiful cars driving on some very, very nice landscape, roady side things, never mentioning people freaking out, not finding a parking spot, never mentioning the children kind of running away from the cars because they're being you know, killed, not mentioning the air, not mentioning the animals, not mentioning the fact that you know, most of the cars are standing for 23 hours a day. No, that is not interesting because you have the beauty. They have this really nice roads that I don't know where they find them, but apparently they exist. There is no traffic jam in any of those advertisements. Do they come along with facts? No. They come along with feelings. And that is ultimately what must inform us when we speak about climate action and overcoming fossil fuel dependencies into a cleaner and a greener world. Yes, we need the facts, but we need to figure out how to make an offer that feels good, that makes people feel like they're on the winning side that makes people feel like they are safe. They're not losing whatever they are, what they care about, but they're winning something that is even nicer and even more beautiful and even more aesthetic. Will we? <laughs> and this is, I think, I don't know, I don't think if I would have ever said this, but I'm saying this, that is how much we can learn from the fossil fuel industries. It is understanding that we need the good solutions, but after all, it is not just about the good solutions, it's about the good feelings and challenging power systems and building up new power systems and new, new ways of people feeling um, safe wherever they work, wherever they live, however they eat, however they want to dress or travel or so on. Second misconception. Third misconception that's very easy, it's a very popular one um, these days. Third big misconception is the idea that just one more crisis will inform people that we actually need to do something. And it's a question that I'm being asked all the time. Maybe people haven't understood it yet because they haven't quite seen the crisis yet. So just one more dry summer, one more wildfire, one more Atal flooding, and then they will surely act. And I think the moment that we understand this is not about us communicating a reality that is dire, but us communicating an offer that is too good to resist. We no longer have to wait for any climate catastrophe to do anything for us. And arguably, I think it's a very bad idea to wait for a catastrophe to do our job because what we're seeing, and that's I think the story of this summer in Europe, no matter how bad it can get out there on the climate front, 
Politicians and people who do not want to act, they won't act. And they will stand in the middle of the flood, like Italy's Prime Minister Meloni, and accuse climate activists for causing the floods. Somehow, they managed to do that. So, whenever wanting to convince someone, don't get stuck on having to, having to present the best available science so people will finally understand it. Don't get stuck on just having the solutions and then get lazy about telling the story about it. And do not wait for the climate catastrophe to do our job before us, because those climate catastrophes, they won't do our job. And luckily enough, that means we do not have to rely on humanitarian disasters for anything good to happen. This is all on us. And I think then, bottom line, it is a beautiful story to tell, and that's where we get to a point of whether it is too late. Because a beautiful story behind all that we fight for, all that is needed, all that can be happening, it's a story that's not happening out there for somewhere else in the future, whatever. No, it's a story that starts with us here and now. It's a story of how people really ask themselves, what makes me happy? Who do I want to be? What is a good life? What do I need to feel safe? What do I want to work for? Where do I spend eight hours a day? Do I spend them somewhere where exploitation and destruction is considered a business model? Or do I work somewhere where we really challenge destructive system and present something else, something freer and nicer and more beautiful? And I think those stories that can be told then and that can be sold, that can be offered to the people, these are ultimately the stories that do not need us to answer whether it's too late, because we understand that no matter what's happening out there, the fact that we are doing something today is all we need, because it means we are investing in the world, we are investing in ourselves, we are investing in each other, we are investing in a common future that could be just so good. Um, and we won't know. We wouldn't know what's happening out there and how far we will go and how we kind of get things done on the larger scale. But just imagining that everyone does that one step and because we all do it and we can rely on each other, it will work out. I think after all, that's the most beautiful story to tell. Thank you so much. Okay, <laughs> so thank you for your interesting keynote. Um, have some water, you. Um, before we begin with our discussion, let's take a moment to look back to 2018. Climate activism was already a big part of your life and Fridays for Future was just about to start. If you could give younger Luisa some advice, what would you tell her? Uh, sleep as long as you can. <laughs> because I will take away the sleep from you. Um, no? No? I think, I think <laughs> it, it, was, uh, yeah, it was like, I have no regrets, I think, on that side. I should have changed my email password. I got very badly hacked. I think that was, <laughs> that was, that was bad, yeah. Okay, but apart from the personal stuff, do you think she would be proud of how far climate action has come until today? Um... Like, my, if, if my younger self was proud of my older self? No, not of yourself, but of, uh, of the, how far the, like the debate action has come. Oh. No. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I think it's... Uh, um, I think I'm just really lucky that I didn't listen to the people who said it couldn't be done. Um, and I think many people will know this. And I think as a student, you, you have this moment. I had, like, I have it when I study and I tell people, you know, I will have to finish this kind of exam thingy until Friday. And people will look at me like, say, oh, no, that's impossible. You can't do that. And then you're like, well, fuck it, I have to do it. So you go ahead, right? And then you finish an hour early and you're like, yeah. Watch me. And I think, uh, <laughs> um, and then you forgot the quotations, but you know, that's a different story. <laughs> and I think it is that kind of, well, it's got to be done. 
so we got to do it mentality that was really helpful and it's interesting because um there is this effect when you want to excite people for something, right? And I mean, my job is to excite people to join something that is, you know, um, you know, that doesn't sound like much of a good offer. Because it's a big crisis and you can get, you know, in a very bad mood over it. Um, and then, you know, you will go home and people will challenge you whether you still eat meat. So it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not the best offer, right? But there is this thing that in the beginning when we started, um, I would write emails and say, hey, we do this thing, it's like on Fridays, um, and, and we go to the street and so on, and um, I mean, I, you know, I, I wanted to excite people for something that didn't exist yet. And that's tricky because people have so many reasons to challenge it. They would say, oh no, but the rain. And then they said in the beginning it was a big thing because it was just about Christmas. So they would say, no, it's Christmas. And I said, yes, it's a climate crisis, you know. So, um, and so people find a trigger and reasons because there isn't something built yet. There isn't something that's out in the world. So it's just an idea. And I think, you know, ideas can be challenged so easily. Um, and the moment, though, that it was out there and people saw it and felt it, um, something flipped and suddenly so many people came and said, oh, well, that's, a, that's not too bad, you know, can I, can I join and so on? And it got me really thinking about how, um, how much it's worth to defend an idea for it to become a reality. And I think making that transition from an idea to a reality, that's the hardest bit of all. Um, because it's just in your head and it's in your heart, but, you know, and it's, it's worth it though. I think for many things in life, not just about the climate. Um, so in recent years, your role as a climate activist has put you into the public eye. Um, and I imagine that you have um, a big network of support. But being a public figure also means confronting resistance, critics, hate. Even we as the Tom Speaker series actually received some criticism about our decision to invite yeah, you. Yeah, I imagine that. <laughs> How dare you? Yeah. Yeah. We're not used to that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can say that. Um, <laughs> it's really funny, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how do you deal with that criticism and hate? So do you have a coping mechanism? Or did, did you just develop a thick skin over time? Um, okay, so there's a, I think there are two different things, like levels to that. I think we face increasingly a extent of societal hate that is dangerous, that puts people like out there in serious danger. I mean, I have to bring, you know, um, security people to speak here. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? But it's a, uh, and that, I mean, and I'm, I'm a white woman, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm educated and I'm, I'm known, so I'm as privileged as you can get without being a man, right? So, <laughs> um, and so, I mean, and, and I see those threats and I'm only, you know, a, 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 some case for so many threats for other people where, where you know, for, for other people of color and, and activists in a more difficult setting and so on. And I think that kind of hate that is happening on the internet, that's happening in politics, but that's happening also openly on the streets, I refuse to make it a private problem of mine. And I get a lot of interview questions about this, so how do you feel about it? And I'm like, this is not about my feelings, but this is a, about a democracy and how we resist that hate. How do we make the internet a safe space where people, you know, stick to rules and, and, and respect each other. And so I think that is a societal issue that I'm kind of part of, but that isn't really about me. And where I would again and again and again ask for people to make it a political issue, a democratic issue, um, challenge um, decisions. I mean, Bavaria is a good example of how, you know, you can put climate activists under absurd amount of repression so much that you will be internationally known as a place that is not safe for activists. I mean, that, uh, so that's the one side. And then there is the other one, um, and that is, of course, you know, people don't liking me and so on. And I'm, I'm you know what? <sighs> I imagine it just spending like your energy i mean it's 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 their hate right it's not mine so it's their like i, I just don't think it's a um 
I, 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 to be very honest, I think I'm a bit sorry sometimes because I feel, man, like find a hobby, do something nice for you know, <laughs> you know, uh, you know. When I'm in a really bad place, I always make pancakes, you know, do something like it's a. But it's like I don't know. I just don't think it's a good idea to spend your afternoons on Facebook, you know, talking about how you don't like that woman. I'm just <laughs> so yeah. Um, I don't really care about that so much. And also, I think it's a bit mean sometimes because they have, yes, people write hate, but everyone else is amazing and does amazing things and cares and so on. So I kind of don't want to let that overshadow the, the beautiful things out there so much. So on a more positive note, um, your activism also has provided you the opportunity to meet many delegations, politicians, business representatives, and also the opportunity to speak on big international stages. Um, how does it make you feel as a young climate activist to interact with this type of probably a bit older audience? And do you have the feeling that you're really being heard by them? Uh, I mean, I mean, f for once, um, mm, I'm not sure if this is about me being heard or us being there. Um, I mean, the Pope, right? Very nice, humorous, very, very nice meeting. I can't possibly tell him anything that he wouldn't yet know, right? And I don't think at that point, you know, with like people who are generally informed, I do not think it's necessarily about that specific message that I could send, but around the fact that he would invi invite someone like young climate activists. He, alongside, he invited refugees, um, Nobel um, Prize physics professors, um, representing, I would say, a very um, genuine and, and yeah, very um, mindful approach to, to, to a world society. Um, and so sometimes people, you know, they talk about those th situations to being like just a symbolic thing. And I'm thinking, yes, that's, that's all we need right now. It's about that moment that people sit down and think, well, I hate that woman, but why is she hanging out with this guy? Like, you know, it's a, it, in some ways it might be just more powerful or the most powerful thing is the fact that we are together. And then I try to not, you know, then I try to make sense of what I say. Um, but days are long, not always working out. <laughs> but yeah, so I'm thinking, yeah, it's uh, it, the fact that we brought, and that was our mission, or that is our mission, bringing the climate crisis in the most powerful places that they are. Um, to bring them, you know, acknowledging that the climate crisis isn't the elephant in the room, but it is the room. So and this must change dynamics in which decisions are being made, how meetings are constituted, who is coming together, um, do, do you like free a chair for some kind of climate to sit on there? Or do you say, should we maybe relocate and consider what we need to tackle the crisis? I think it's much more about that. And then, of course, we need people to be informed and to talk and to do those, all those things. But yeah. Do you think that is the most um, influential way that you can advocate for climate um, policies or um, faster no, no, climate no, no, action? No, 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 no. I mean, that is like it, it, those meetings. It's like one person half. It's a tiny bit of my time. I, it's nice, you know. I do it, but I think the most important thing is empowering and informing and activating people. I mean, after all, um, and I think people also. Maybe it's worth to just for a second consider what is change. Um, change is not linear, right? So it's not me going to the Pope and then the Pope saying, ah, yeah, truth, it's climate, that's an issue. And then, you know, he says some things and suddenly we have the Catholic Church worldwide divesting, divesting their fossil fuel assets. Like, that's not... But what, what is rather happening is that, you know, in this instance, it was actually... Um, we see that people come together and they organize around an issue and then one of them happens to be a young Catholic guy from France. So and he, fund, he opens up this Catholic network of youth in France and they find their Italian friends and they think, wait, we're in Italy, can't we start a campaign in Rome that is focusing on the Vatican and then they bring together this 
guy from Eritrea and they bring this guy from northern Germany and they think, you know what, maybe we can even get into the Vatican. So, and then they find out, you know, wait, we could actually write something and it could be a thing and then you publish it. The, 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 and these are all things that happen not because someone says A and then B happens, but because um, energies flow and people invest in a community and in a moment in a collective and then things kind of work out. So, um, and for that Pope to have a meeting of a climate activist, thousands of people, I would say tens of thousands of people have been working in some twisted way to get that done. Um, and that was a fundament on which you then can build up things. So when I, you know, when I wonder how do we organize change, this is, it starts with organizing us and with understanding that we need to develop that trust that I do something and it makes sense because someone else does something too. I mean, that's a, that's a mean thing in the climate crisis, right? You look at it and then you immediately feel like, oh, it's too big, you know, and then kind of go back to Netflix. Um, been there, done that. And um, yeah, and then and, and, and it, it makes sense because we are trained to, 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 to focus on us and it's me and my career and everything I do, I have to kind of work up myself and then I also benefit out of that. And it's a, in a way, it's egocentrism and apathy that is a base of climate disasters, right? It's people deciding, I do what I do, and I don't have to look le left and right, and I don't have to change, uh, challenge the uh, consequences. So what is the counter dose to that? I would say it's to develop some kind of global consciousness, to develop some global trust in a world that is very fragmented, to say, I do something, and someone else who does something in a different time, someone I've never met before, gives my actions some specific meaning. And when you look closely, you see it everywhere. And I think Lützerath, for instance, in Germany, the big coal protests that we have, were a good example. You could say it's a, it's a story of loss because a village was destructed after lots of protest. Yet when you now go around, I'm speaking to my friends in Japan, in Slovenia, in Georgia, it is all the places where people started some actions because they saw what is happening in Lützerath, they saw what is possible, and they saw that you can actually challenge those systems. Um, and that, I think, is a story of change that is never linear, and um, that is something that starts with organizing us and organizing uh, yeah, a, a, a global consciousness. Hello, let's... Yeah. Good. Let's zoom in a little on, on Germany and talk about its role and influence uh, in the climate context. Currently, Germany is responsible for only about 2% of global CO2 emissions, but of course, historically, it's a complete different story, and Germany is in the top five of the largest emitters. Right now, we still see other countries building coal power plants. Uh, at the same time, we also see investors backing out of coal prop, uh, coal projects because it's no longer profitable enough. What or how can we advocate for like climate activism without sacrificing our economic and political leverage that we currently have as Germany? Um, yeah. And that's a, that's a bit of a funny question because I think five years ago it would have been very hard to explain, but looking around today, Germany's economy arguably is struggling so much because they have failed to adjust to global green transitions. Like everyone is talking about the US because they have an Inflation Reduction Act that subsidizes green investments. Certainly, I don't think it's something that we should copy one-on-one, but it's, it gives an idea of where global economies are going. Germany's solar energy is completely dependent on China, which is m maybe not the most reliable partner to have right now. Um, and we see that, you know, foreign countries, even in the EU, are putting pressure on Germany because we can't even agree to something banal as an end of the combustion engine. So I would say the economic case is something that has rapidly changed in the last years. We see global investments driving towards um, clean energies. We're seeing solar capacities for the first time outrunning fossil fuel capacities when it comes to um, additional um, capacities. Um, I think, or I'm just, I think just like the World Economic Forum and the Economist and the most renowned economic institutions worldwide, 
that one of the or some of the the, the, the biggest dangers for stable economies are A, climate catastrophes and climate disasters, and B, not adjusting to green economies and to transitions, not finding, and C, maybe not even finding the people to do those, to, to put into those green jobs. Um, and when we see, you know, um, in Germany, I mean, we are facing uh, some, some very tricky financial questions. We see where money is really wasted that is really desperately needed in transitions, but also in social questions and so on, that money that we would need to fuel a transition in, say, the uh, chemistry sector, but also in steel and automobile industries and so on, that money right now is being wasted in the shape of fossil fuel subsidies. So, you know, it's not only that we are lacking the transition, but we're also still funding, um, you know, publicly funding um, an economy that was already out of date yesterday. Um, so I think for the economic case, that's all we have. But as I mentioned earlier, the problem is right now that just having the business case and uh, the case on jobs and on, on future developments and even on global partnerships and so on, just having that case isn't enough. Because we see fossil fuel interests are just very, very powerful. And I mean, we are seeing elected politician standing up and screaming at a crowd, each schnitzel. And I mean, that is 2023. So we had been talking about, you know, the better argument and the better Mrs. case when it comes to the transitions, may it be in the automobile industry or in the chemistry industry or when it comes to meat or whatever, we are speaking of dogmatism and ideologies. And I think it's helpful to name it as such. Um, we are not fighting a, a, a fight on facts. We are fighting a fight on ideas and of what um, some of our um, governing parties feel like they have to um, offer or, or yeah, present um, to the people. And then I think there's just one thing about this 2% emission thing. So, I mean, you mentioned that historically, you know, Germany is a, one of the countries that's most responsible for the climate crisis. So basically everyone else, most of the other countries could blame us, which they are doing, by the way. Um, then there is the fact that Germany is the largest emitter of Europe, so all of them could also blame us. But then I also think, is there any other political question, any, foreign security, military, welfare, social standards, um, export, is there anything where Germany as a country, as part of the G7, would go out and say, no, nah, actually we don't matter so much there because we're just a tiny fraction. No, of course not. Fucking hell, you know, we would go out and say, yeah, we now have a, we have a, we go out and say, yeah, we also have some military that we have to offer. I mean, that is ridiculous because I'm uh, um, looking at that. But in every other context, Germany would go out and say, yeah, so we should be in the room when we make that decision. We have something to say there. They would get out and say, yeah, we present a plan to the G7 to solve problem A, B, and C. And by the way, we want to also be in that club and that commission. But when it comes to the climate, I do actually think they can pretend they just don't, you know, they're not in the room. And this is, this is not irresponsible only on emission, like on, on emission and responsibilities, but this is also just ridiculous because clearly what we do matters and whether we do, you know, whether we miss climate targets and whether we fail to stick to global agreements and fail to invest and fail to transform, that sets a standard. So that sets a very clear sign worldwide as well. And so if, if we make a difference in any way, let's please, you know, let's grow up and make the best out of that, right? So you've also mentioned in your talk, and I think it's uh, quite clear to all of us that the science, of course, tells us we need to speed up. Um, but we have also observed growing frustration with the pace in, in two senses. So for once, some people find climate action too fast, um, mostly citing economical concerns, um, Germany facing a recession right now. Um, other people find climate action too slow, and they've turned to more controversial measures um, in an attempt to accelerate climate action, um, which has also generated a lot of attention and mixed reactions mm -hmm. at best. Uh, and also Fridays for Future has recently been associated with some controversies. Has climate activism and climate action missed at moments? Can Fridays for Future still remain attractive in the current discourse? 
Um, I think this, I mean, the climate question is not about a specific movement, but it's rather about, I would say, a societal vibe or an energy that is there, like an, we can do it, we schaffen das energy, or, you know, um, you know, game over energy, you know, it's a, it's a question we're fighting. And it's very interesting how you say it, because I think that is, it describes the societal situation quite well, that on paper, barely anything is happening, and yet there are some people shouting out that this is way too much and way too fast, and others would say, you know, let's burn it all because we're doomed. Um, and here again, I think we're missing the important point. I would say that what makes a society agree to certain policies is much less the policy itself, but the feeling of trust and the feeling of safety. Will I be safe when these things come? Does the government have my back? Do they consider me when I'm a low-income household? Do they consider me with my job and all of that I've earned? Will I be in a, will they, um, will they build that security that I need? Um, and I think politics that fails to communicate climate measures as a question of national security, of safety and of trust will vary. And I mean, that's what we're seeing, I mean, everywhere we'll see how things, you know, go downhill and uphill and um, all over the place very quickly. And suddenly, you know, people will be scared of measures that are never, ever been even planned to put in place. Um, so I think we need the good solutions, we need the good policies, and we need um, movements also to, to make the case, to build the pressure. But ultimately, I think we need to find a way to understand climate again as something, or climate action as something that doesn't take from people, but that gives to people. And um, in a very beautiful way, that is very much possible in the moment that things pay off. So what makes this moment so hard, both for movement and the government, is that we are in a transition phase that kind of sucks, like where everyone for short moments feels like a loser. And you see that inner cities, when you kind of rebuild inner cities and you say, let's take away some space for the cars and, you know, have a new bus lane and, you know, green it up and make it nice for the children and for the shops. There is a moment where you just have a construction site and everyone is stuck in traffic and everyone feels bad about it. And that is, I would say, basically the setting that this entire society is in right now. We all feel like a bit like we're on a construction site. Um, you don't know, you know, where's the front and where's the end. Um, things don't work out. Um, and there are men running around and shouting <laughs> um, at each other. <laughs> and uh, so, and this phase is there, but I think when it comes to winning people over, we need to, we need to really discuss how to, to rapidly speed up that phase. Because the moment that you see, ooh, you know, I've been yelling around the people saying, don't take away my cars, no one ever wanted to take care of their cars. Um, but I've kind of defending freakishly my right to drive to my work every day. But the moment, I say this, by the way, with a mom who is a nurse who drives to work, just as <laughs> some of my friends have cars. I said, like, it's not a, um, but the moment that you see there is an alternative that works out for me, maybe, you know, that's the moment that allows you to kind of forget about what you thought you would need and wouldn't survive otherwise. And you see what actually, you know, benefits you too. So before we come to the Q&A, we have prepared some rapid fire questions. As the name already says, um, you're supposed to be uh, answering very fast and very short. Okay. Do I speak fast? No, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Are you ready? I am. Uh, at which talk show do you feel most at home? Markus Lanz, Anne Villa, or Sandra Maischberger? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> you can say none of the so above. So I can <laughs> say Sandra Maischberger has um, better drinks. That's an answer. <laughs> Markus Lanz offers sushi. <laughs> so it's, I would say it's a tie. Okay. Um, where do you prefer to speak, TV or podcast? Ooh, podcast much. And podcast or our stage? 
I've never felt more at home than here. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you could have dinner with any person in the world, who would it be? Dinner? Yeah. Um, who I haven't had dinner yet with? You can also say someone, like a dinner that is, was really nice, so we thought you know, Okay, that's very cliche, but I read today on Twitter that, you know, something like imagine the possibilities if Taylor Swift was together with a climate scientist. <laughs> and I think genuinely, I think we should work on that one. So if I could bring a climate scientist to Taylor Swift, I think it would be good. Okay. <laughs> Do you have any secret talent? Do I have one? A secret talent. Oh, um... Oh, <laughs> ich habe gerade überlegt, ob wir unter uns sind. Ja, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I am. Um, I'm actually. I'm, I'm really like. So I'm a. I'm a ski instructor by training. So my skiing works out. Oh, me too. And I. Oh yeah. <laughs> see. And it's a, uh, it's a. It's a. It's a. It's a. It's a. Retrospectively, kind of bad choice, but you kind of. And um, and I. I'm really enthusiastic in uh, beer pong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Actually, our next question kind of doubles down on it. Um, like, at least the dress is partying. Are you getting into Berghain? You're living in Berlin? Uh, that is funny, actually. Like, I... Oh, no, guys. No, no, no. We're gonna, everyone's <laughs> getting a shower. <laughs> yeah, it was nice. So let's open up the floor, right? That's a good question. <laughs> Um, what would like people to know about you apart from Fridays for Future and climate activism? Ooh, um, what I would like, but I think people know way too much. Like I'm like I'm okay. <laughs> no, it's I don't know. It's uh, um, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't think there's anything left. <laughs> no, I'm just you know. I think. Yeah, no, I, I don't like it. Okay. Is this like an opinion thing? Should I say something like, no, not you something. don't have to say anything. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, okay. We're getting a bit politi political again. Um, COP28, marketing oh. or action? What? what? Um, marketing or action? Oh, um, I think they try a combination <laughs> this year. Um, we will see. Um, but they're both, um, like, they're all there. Um, inspired by the Barbie movie, the next one, you've seen it? Yes, of okay. course. Um, Birkenstocker high heels. <laughs> um, no, and I think, like, I was, I was on the Birky front for a long time. But also, by the way, that movie is a very good example of facility, right? It's a, I mean, it's a feminist powerhouse, that whole movie, and a very long advertisement for a blue car. Um, and that's, you know, it's a, it's, it, it makes so much sense, you know, why would you bother to make a business plan for a car if you can just put it in any movie that people watch and go out? I mean, it's, it's amazing, but I think we need to find our ideas to, um, you know, make the best movies ever and place the good ideas of climate action inside of them. Yeah, but that's just a side note. Okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's a short answer thing, sorry. <laughs> okay, so our last one. Yeah. What gives you hope in current times? What gives me hope? Yeah. Um, that we're here today. I think the hope. I think people sometimes like hope is something that is in this moment, right? I mean, risking now to open up a very philosophical question, but I think people have a very strange, uh, like. I think we need to talk about hope a lot because I think people have strange conceptions of where hope is coming from, and hope is not something that when that waits for us at the end of the way. But hope is the fact that we are walking that way. And that's all the difference. Like the future isn't there and the, the past is gone. We can't change that one. So hope is only in that very moment. And that's so beautiful and so liberating because we can decide in every, each and every moment we can decide this is hope because we come together, we do something, we say something, we think something, we breathe, we stay silent. That's also hope. And I think putting, like tying your hope to someone else doing something else, you know, that's, this, this is, this is doomed to fail because you will be failed. Because hope shouldn't be tied on one politician or one party or one company or one whoever somewhere else to do something. That will make you like, that will, you know, very likely make you very miserable. So I think, um, yeah, 
like look before you and in this moment and I think there's the hope and that's why I'm here and I think that's why people come together to spend a Tuesday, a Tuesday, <laughs> Tuesday night on the climate. I think that is really, um, it's not out there, it's here. Okay, so I think at this point, <laughs> We will give the word to our audience now. Um, you know the drill, raise your hand if you want to ask a question. We will get to you with a microphone. Uh, keep your questions short and we want to answer as many questions as possible. Yeah, please. And can we, can we do it like quotiert or how do you work in München? Like in, so I study in Göttingen, it's very, um, but they do like a quotierte Redeliste. So, can we do it? Okay. I've never heard of it. Um, yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's start with a. Okay. Thank you. So, how can movements convince um, people to more climate action? I think Fight the Future is doing a great job to uh, make pressure on politics, uh -huh. but politicians are voted by normal people that probably. Uh, don't have much time for this topic or climate action is way too much for their daily day between work and other things. Thank you. Um, yeah, very good point. I think first thing is we need to understand climate as not a youth problem, but as a society problem. Um, second is um, I think we need to get rid of the idea that this is about one party doing something. We need like democratic consensus on those key questions because otherwise we will end up what we have now with the ampel like it's a mess and um, because two parties feel like they're losing whenever it comes to climate action so they won't allow it and i think that is how you really you know um, make a very good case for for failing um, on climate and um, so working on that one and i think th 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 the most important thing is that um or not, make me not one of the most important things is that uh people understand or like people are being made an offer that works for their life and I think one of the very powerful things is to understand or like to communicate and to talk about how people can benefit from climate action but also how people's jobs, health, childcare, um, pensionship question would all benefit in their different ways of how they live with good and solid climate action. That's number one thing. And then from that on, taking it up to um, pressure whatever party you vote for, whatever democratic party you vote for, to implement some of those points. Um, if people feel like they have to decide between voting for the party they've always voted for and voting for climate action, that works maybe for one election, but then people will flip back People will be disappointed because they said, oh no, jetzt habe ich aber die Grünen gewählt und die haben es aber gar nicht geschafft. Ne? And, now, and then they go back and then you have a, you know, you know it well here all in München, right? That's a, and you, so, then you, yeah. It's, it's a, so what we need is to build sustainable, um, sustainable um, agendas in each of the democratic parties because they feel like their voters demand it. So, that's a two-step thing for people, understanding how they benefit and how they need and how they might want good climate action. And then second step, understanding that they will need to tell this to their politicians, to, to their friends, to their communities and so on. Um, and I think what gives us a very good example is this, I'm not sure if it's a real story about, or it's a fairy tale, but it's a good story, so I'm gonna tell it anyhow. So when, you know, their colleague Seehofer, um, had a big problem with refugees and uh, didn't want, you know, to follow Merkel in 2015. At least there is a story being told about Seehofer going out to the streets of a refugee welcome protest, seeing people in suits, seeing Christians, seeing workers, seeing old people there, understanding these are all my voters. And if I go against refugee, I go against my own voters. And this, I think, is a very, very good example of how what we need, what politicians need to see out there in societies, in communities, in order to actually fundamentally and sustainably commit to climate action. Yeah. Thank you. 
Yeah, like maybe down there. Um, how can the different climate movements grow together and um, what would motivate everyone here in the Audimax tonight to take part in the next climate strike? Ooh. Um, it's Friday, so yes, in, in, in Munich, I think. So I think so, right? Is, is there Fridays for Future? Super. Yeah, goodie. Um, so yes, you should do that. Um, Sorry, what was the first question? Ah, the movements. Yeah, so I think we need unity when it comes to the baselines, right? We need unity when it comes to basic solidarity across movements, not even in the climate sector alone, but also when it comes to social rights and all these things. I do think we need a diversity of tactics, um, and we do not need to agree on the best way to protest. We only need to agree on the fact that we need to protest, and that's a big difference. Um, when we, as climate movements, want to allow people from different generations and um, party backgrounds and, and sectors and um, corners of society to have a movement that they identify with, movements shouldn't be all the same. Movements need to be diverse. They need to spread out and get out of this kind of eco-niche that some fossil fuel interests would like us to kind of hide in, but instead go out and take the floor. And, and, and grow to something where people find a, a spot that they identify with. So I'm, I think, yes, let's stand together when we need to, but let's, you know, grow wide and, and um, big when it comes to making that offer. Um, okay. Um, hi. Can you ever imagine yourself going into politics and um, being part of the decision-making process in our government? Um, I think the decision-making um, processes in the governments right now um, are all we need to know to answer that question. Um, I don't envy anyone who is in government right now, and uh, I think maybe that I think. I mean, I'm 27, why would I rule out the decisions in my life at this age? I mean, you know, this is going to be on social media, so it's going to come back to me, so I don't know, right? <laughs> um, this doesn't make sense, and I think it doesn't make sense for anyone to kind of rule out anything, you know, because we're young. Just I do think that there is a bit of an over, like, uh, it's not a word, but let's say it's an over-expectation <laughs> to what governments will do in the climate crisis. We need the best people in government, right? And we need to governments to be informed and have really, you know, good people there. Um, but when we look at like the track records of democratic governments worldwide, we find that eventually, whether they go and commit to climate action or not, was much less a question of the specific government, but of a societal and political um, energy around them. And so I think it is easy to assume well, we just put the green people in the government and then they will do the job. To be very frank, that is what we did and it kind of didn't work out so far, right? Um, so I think it makes sense to put trust and invest in people working in civil society, in business, in media, um, and so on and so forth and acknowledge that to be just as important as what is happening, you know, in, in politics when it comes to those big changes. Um, and I sometimes feel it's a bit odd that people ask me, like, do you want to, like, people often frame it in the way that they say, do you want to step up into politics? Like, that would be responsibility, but everyone who is working in communities is not taking responsibility. Um, that's not well, how I would understand society says. So, yeah. I don't, um, yeah. And I think... Um, no, so much on that. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that we don't really have more time. We could be listening to you a lot longer. Um, so thank you, Luisa, for being here today. Um, thanks to the team for organizing this event. And of course, thanks to all of you um, joining our opening event. Uh, if you're interested in our upcoming events, follow the Tim Speaker series on Instagram or LinkedIn to get the latest news. Um, Wherever you're off to now, be safe, take the U-Bahn and not the Uber, 
and have a spooky Halloween. And give it up for Luisa. Thank you. Thank you.